You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Love Cast at savage.love. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Love Cast. A little personal news. Five months after rotator cuff surgery, I am back on my bike again with my doctor's permission. I don't know where you listen to podcasts. I don't know where you're hearing the sound of my voice right now, but riding my bike is my favorite place to listen to shows because I can concentrate. I'm not tempted to open Twitter and start scrolling while I'm listening. If you listen on your bike too, maybe you've had this experience. You're riding along. The show you wanted to listen to ends. A new one starts. And the new one isn't an episode of a show you were planning to listen to, but you're on your bike and you don't want to stop. So you go ahead and listen to that show you weren't planning to listen to. And then you wind up learning something kind of amazing. That happened to me today. I was listening to the Ezra Klein show. And man, the series Ezra Klein has done over the last seven weeks on the Israelis and the Palestinians deserves all the podcasting Pulitzers. Anyway, Klein's show ends and a history extra podcast about astronomy begins and I couldn't give a shit about astronomy, but I didn't want to pull over and change shows. So I listened to the interview on History Extra with science historian James Hannum, author of How the Earth Became Round, all about astronomy. And eventually during the interview, he began to talk about the Big Bang Theory. And I learned something from Hannum that I didn't know before. But he didn't coin the words the Big Bang. That was done by somebody who didn't believe him, a chap called... Fred Hoyle, who was an English astronomer, and he thought this idea was completely crazy, and he coined the term Big Bang to try and mock it. But it caught on, and that's why we call it the Big Bang. So the Big Bang was an insult. It was a slur that was eventually embraced and adopted by the people it was meant to demean. Huh. A term of derision appropriated by the people it was intended to insult kind of like the queers did with queer, and sex workers did with whore. Lesbians go to dyke marches, sex-positive women go to slut walks, gay men call their friends fags, and the Big Bang too. Which brings me in a roundabout kind of way to adult babies, or back to adult babies. In case you missed last week's show, Ariana Grande pop star is dating Ethan Slater, Broadway star, Slater left his wife and infant child for Grande and a gossip site, posted a photo of Slater in a baby bonnet, and a bunch of people on the internet jumped to the conclusion that Slater was into diapers. I talked about that last week at the top of the show. This week, the Adult Baby Anti-Defamation League, not to be confused with the Adult Baby Anti-Defecation League, has come crying to me. Toddler Cub, a gay ABDL into bears of the Teddy and non-Teddy variety, according to his bio, took to Twitter to cry. Hey, Dan Savage, in this week's intro, you used weird to describe ABDL people like me five times. Fine, okay, whatever. But then you compared being an ABDL weirdo to being a shitty husband and bad dad. (laughs) Follow up to that tweet, Toddler Cub. I wonder what would happen if Dan Savage mocked queer trans people, calling them weirdos, comparing them unfavorably to shitty dads and bad husbands. Toddler Cub tagged HuffPost in that one and a few other media outlets in an effort to get me canceled, grounded, put in the timeout corner. Since HuffPo hasn't reached out for comment, I'm going to go ahead and comment here. I did not compare ABDL fetishists to bad dads and shitty husbands. Let us go to the tape. And as it turns out, Slater's phone was not hacked. It's a press photo. Slater's on Broadway right now in the revival of Spamalot, and there's a scene in which he plays a baby in a carriage in a baby bonnet. So, a shitty husband and bad dad, at least out of the gate. He has decades to make it up to his kid, maybe. But an adult baby? I want to say no, but he might be. Anybody could be. You could be. I could be. I'm not. You can hear me shift in my seat on this show every once in a while. You've never heard my pants crinkle. But that photo isn't proof that Ethan Slater is an adult baby weirdo. And hey, if you see a man in a baby costume, a clearly comic baby costume, and your mind immediately goes 
there to ABDL, then you're the weirdo. So no, I didn't compare adult babies to bad dads favorably or unfavorably. We have some proof Slater is a shitty husband. He did abandon his wife shortly after she gave birth, but he has plenty of time to be a good dad. And really all I said was the photo that was circulating on the internet wasn't proof that whatever else he might be, Slater was an adult baby too. Now, in fairness to toddler cub, I did use the word weird a lot, but there's nothing wrong with being weird. Sex weirdos are my favorite weirdos. I will take the sex weirdos like ABDLs over the kind of leering, kink-shaming, judgmental weirdos who were coming for Slater all last week. Honest sex weirdos are much better company than judgmental sex muggles. Anyway, what I wanted to say to all the outraged adult babies out there who are just tuning into the Lovecast, weird isn't an insult around here. Around here on this show, weirdo, like queer and pervert and slut and whore and faggot and big fucking bang, is a compliment. And I'm a bit of a weirdo myself. I may not be an adult baby weirdo, or I might be, you never know. But like I said last week, I've seen adult babies at fetish events that I personally attended. And since no one goes to fetish events for the food, it's safe to assume I was there because I'm a weirdo too. And speaking of rotator cuff surgery, Francis is a Lovecast listener. Hey, Francis, this is a shout out for you, Francis. Francis just got rotator cuff surgery. And what she needs right now, in addition to powerful pain medications, are your bingeable TV show recommendations and podcast obsessions. I already shared with Francis the shows that helped get me through the hardest part after surgery, those first few weeks. And if you've got a recommendation you'd like to pass along, audiobooks, podcasts, TV shows, slide on into Francis's DMs. She is on Instagram at framboise underscore NYC. That's F-R-A-M-B-O-I-S-E underscore NYC. Hit her with your best recs and your good vibes. All right, coming up on today's show on the micro, tons of your cues, lots of my A's, and on the magnum, Savage Lovecast, Savage Lovecast all-star guest, Dr. Debbie Herbenick returns to talk about her new book, Yes, Your Kid, What Parents Need to Know About Teens and Sex. All that coming up on today's show. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. This episode of the Lovecast is brought to you by the good folks at Squarespace. They make it easy to build a beautiful website, blog, or online store. Head on over to squarespace.com slash savage for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code SAVAGE to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. This episode is brought to you by Helix Sleep. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders and a free bedroom bundle for our listeners in honor of Cyber Monday. The bundle includes two free pillows, as well as a set of sheets and a mattress protector. Go to helixsleep.com slash savage and use the code HELIXPARTNER25. Hi, Dan. I'm a mid-30s straight cis woman in the Midwest, and I have a question about dating etiquette. How in detail should you go into the why when ending a short-term relationship? Should you keep it short and simple? We're not compatible. Or should you explain why you're ending things? Um, So to give a little bit of a context, I was in a long-term relationship for over a decade and I am using dating apps for the first time and I'm finding it very exhausting. But recently I went on several dates with a guy and we had sex last night and I realized I don't want to continue seeing him, but not because of the sex. He was actually very good in bed and very generous, but because he's sort of generally insecure and I'm a people pleaser, um, so I was feeling like I had to assuage his ego, um, and that's something that I don't really want to do moving forward. And so I'm worried that he'll think that I'm breaking up with him because of the sex when that really isn't the why. So do I explain that it wasn't the sex, or do I just say that we aren't compatible? At least you're not thinking about ghosting. Got to give you some credit there. There are so many people running around on the dating scene now who will go on a few dates, fuck somebody once, twice, a dozen times, and then just go, when they realize they don't want to pursue things any further, go fucking silent. You're not thinking about 
ghosting. You're not going to go silent on this guy. You are thinking about what exactly it is that you should or shouldn't say to him and the conclusion he's likely to jump to if you end things now after a few dates and the first fuck session. He's going to think it was, obviously, he's going to think it was the fucking. And if he's insecure, as you say he is, he's probably going to feel really bad about the fucking or start to doubt his own skills, which you say aren't that bad. So in the spirit of leaving somebody in better shape than you found them and sticking that dismount and ending a very short-term relationship successfully, what do you do? What do you err on the side of? Which nerve are you going to sandpaper? His insecurities about his interpersonal skills or his insecurities about his sexual skills? Uh, if I was in your situation, I would go with, look, I'm just not feeling it. I don't feel that we're emotionally compatible. Just drop that word emotional, emotionally before compatible. And that'll make it clear, hopefully, that at least be a, a hint or a gesture to the sex was fine. You're good in bed. It's the rest of it. It's the interpersonal stuff that I'm not feeling. And then uh, you have to make a judgment call based on his reaction. He may not want to hear another fucking word from you. He may be, you know, you'll get, he'll get the text and it's fine to do this in a text after a few dates and one fuck session. And thank you for your service or thank you for letting him know. And then you'll never hear from him ever again. Or he, as some insecure people are prone to do, may demand more information. If he felt the dates went well and the sex went well, and now you want to end things, he may want to know why. And what do you have to lose leveling with him? If indeed he asks that follow-up question, if he asks you for more information, if he asks you for more of a download, what do you have to lose? Letting him have it. Tell him, look, emotionally you're really insecure. I found that on our three or four dates, most of the time we were spending together, I was doing a whole lot of emotional labor, reassuring you. And we, I barely knew you and that wasn't fair to me. And I could see that if we wound up in a relationship that that would be 90% of our interactions would be me bucking you up and reassuring you and addressing your insecurities. And I wasn't interested in that. So you're good in bed. You should lead with that. Lead with the dick, but go get some therapy. This is the download you might do if he demands a lengthier, or more detailed explanation about why you're ending things, which he might not, which he might not. If you just drop that word emotionally, look, it's nice to meet you. I enjoyed spending some time with you. The sex was awesome. I just don't feel that emotionally we're compatible, period. The end, most likely. But then if he wants more info, you can give it to him. Some people are turned on by visuals. Those people are usually men people. Some people are turned on more by voices and stories. In my experience, about hearing about people's fantasies, it's often true that it's women people that are turned on by stories and voices and fantasies. Luckily for women, there's Dipsy. Dipsy is an app that I highly recommend with hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Dipsy brings fantasies to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. Lately, they've been producing more fantasy genre-based stories like the Greek mythology series or supernatural hunks. It is a total blast. Dipsy has stories for straight and queer listeners, and 56% of their stories are voice acted by people of color. New content is released at Dipsy every week, so in between listening to your favorite story again and again and again, you can always find something new to explore. They also have soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and useful workshops like self-massage, massage for a partner, breathwork exercises, a sexting tutorial, and tons of classes and sexy stories you can read. Let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, or heat things up with a partner or the whole squad. For listeners of The Lovecast, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. That's 30 days of full access to everything on Dipsy for free when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. 
Savage. Let them know the Lovecast sent you, dipsystories.com slash savage. Hey, Dan, Nancy, and the tech savvy at risk youth. By guy calling from the Northeast about a long term friendship I have and what to do about it. When I was 16, I was doing community theater, and a guy in his mid 30s kind of befriended me, and we had sort of a mentor mentee kind of friendship uh, that grew. I started dog sitting for him, so I would spend, you know, swaths of time at his house watching his dogs. We would hang out sometimes when he would come back from wherever he was, and we had a great time. It was platonic and friendly and fun. And then when I graduated from high school and I was 18, one day he texted me, said, hey, come over here to my house, but make sure that you can leave your car overnight because we're going to drink. And I was such a kind of good kid in high school that I was so excited that I was going to get to drink. So I, I came over, you know, I gave him my keys. We hung out. We drank for a while because I had very little experience with alcohol. I got pretty drunk and pretty soon he started propositioning me. And I was kind of like nervous and noncommittal. I think that if you read my body language, you could probably tell I was uncomfortable, but it was a little ambiguous, I think. And after kind of a few asks, the people pleaser in me kind of kicked in. And I was like, you know what? It's going to be more awkward if I just make him feel bad and awkward. And it'll be easier if we just like fool around a little bit. And we did. Going out of that experience, I didn't really know what to think about it. I was very confused, but we still maintained our friendship. Every once in a while, when we would hang out, he would kind of proposition me. But because I knew that could be coming, I was kind of prepared to say no. And he did take no for an answer those times. Sometimes he would ask a couple times, but he would still take no for an answer. And then we kind of had this ongoing, pretty like completely platonic friendship from then out. Now, as I'm getting older and I'm getting to the age that he was when he met me when I was 16, I'm becoming more and more uncomfortable looking back on this relationship. And it's gotten to the point where it's almost hard for me to communicate with him. I basically ghosted him for the last four months because I don't really know what to say. My partner thinks that I should not have a relationship with this person. and I totally see where they're coming from. So my question for you is, bearing in mind that there are a lot of happy memories with this person, is it a net positive to keep them in my life or should I cut them out of my life? And if I do cut them out of my life, what do I owe them? Do I owe them an explanation? Am I being an asshole by, you know, all of a sudden ghosting them and, you know, 10 years after the fact, kind of like moving the goalpost? He knew who you were when he met you when you were 16 years old. He saw that people pleaser in you. And he knew exactly what he was doing two years later, after you were 18 years old. And he invited you over to get shit faced at his house and asked you not to bring your car because he knew that by the time he was through with you, you would be in no condition to drive. A lot of people are going to look at just the ages here, the age you were 18, the age he was mid thirties and see that as the problem. But I don't think the ages of the parties involved here, I don't think your age was the issue. You were above the age of consent, but your story is proof that consent, as Christine Emba argues in Rethinking Sex, is a ceiling, not a floor. Consent, consenting adults, the barest minimum. And this guy, despite the fact that you were 18 years old and could consent to sex, he violated you in so many ways that had nothing to do with your age. Your call, your question, your history, it's proof that something can be consensual, at least where the ages of all involved are concerned, and be very deeply fucked up. I want to zoom out here for a second. When we talk about 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds sleeping with people in their 30s and 40s, the assumption is always that it's the 30 or 40 year old, the older person who's preying on the younger person, as was the case here. But just getting the ages of the people involved doesn't give us all the information that we might need. There are 18 year olds out there who are attracted to older men and older women. There are 18 year olds out there who choose once they're adults or over the age of consent, our line where people go from children to adults is very blurry. There are people once they are over the age of consent 
who choose to have sex with older partners and they are not being coerced or plied with alcohol as you were or emotionally manipulated as you were. Some people will look back on the sex they had with older partners when they were 18, decades later, with fondness and without regret. And some will look back on those experiences from the vantage point where you are now looking back on that experience and feel uncomfortable, feel violated. Some people in adulthood will look back on those early experiences and wish the older person had done the right thing, the right thing from their new vantage point and said no to them, refused to give them what at 18 they thought they wanted, what they said they wanted, in some cases, what they begged for. That's not your circumstance. You weren't pursuing this guy. This was, you thought, a platonic friendship. And that kind of friendship that when it is actually platonic can be so meaningful for a young person. When you feel like there's an adult out there who shares your interests that you have a rapport with, who treats you like the adult that you are becoming and recognizes in you something, you hope if it's platonic, if they're not sitting on ulterior motives and waiting for you to hit the age of consent, recognizes in you something valuable something worthy of their adult time and attention and friendship. As I listened to your question, which I did a couple of times, it's not the age gap here that I'm bumping on. It's not the age gap here necessarily that is the problem. Although in our current discourse, I think a lot of people are just going to want to look at the age gap and identify that as the biggest or the overarching issue. And the issue here was the emotional manipulation. It was the alcohol it was him knowingly putting you in a position, manipulating you into a position where you didn't want to say no to him because you didn't want to hurt his feelings because you didn't want to make it awkward or weird when he's the one by pouring booze down your throat and hitting on you that made it awkward and weird. You didn't want to lose his friendship and the value that you saw in that friendship. So you went along with it that one time. And you didn't feel great about it and you learned something really important, something valuable. And we sometimes do learn important, valuable things from shitty situations we find ourselves in or we're manipulated into sexually. You learn from that one experience where you just went along with it, that going along with it, having sex you don't want to have to avoid hurting someone's feelings is a terrible reason to have sex and left you feeling not great about the friendship, about the sex, about yourself. And so you didn't say yes the next time. You came away from that experience prepared to say no to him. And I hope to other people who made you feel uncomfortable. In answer to your question, you are not being an asshole by ghosting this guy. He knows what he did. I would ask you, though, what is it that you want? What would you benefit from? This guy is clearly manipulative, but he's not Rasputin. He's not some Svengali. He hasn't hypnotized you. If you can risk a conversation with him and you know you're not going to be sucked in or manipulated because he's not some master manipulator, is there something he could say that even if you never speak to him ever again, you would benefit from hearing? Like, I'm fucking sorry, and I have felt bad about this forever. Or is there something that you might say to him that will leave you feeling better, if only to say to him, I hope you don't do this ever again. I hope you haven't done this ever again to anyone else. And it was deeply fucked up. Ghosting is one way to get this shit off your chest. He'll know why he's not hearing from you anymore. He can put that two and two together. But you don't owe him anything for these years of so-called supposed, perhaps real friendship. What is it that you owe yourself? What is it that you want for you? Irrespective of what I think, irrespective of what your partner thinks. Ask yourself what you would benefit from and then do that. Is there anything worse than going to a mattress store and laying down on a floor model mattress you know hundreds of other people have laid down on before you got there while an overeager sales assistant asks you probing questions? Okay, that's probably someone's kink. And if it's your kink, 
your kink is not my kink, but your kink is okay. It's just not for me. So I was very happy to order my Helix mattress online and receive easy, no contact delivery. The Helix lineup offers 20 unique mattresses, including a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers and even a mattress made just for kids. Take the Helix sleep quiz and find your ideal mattress in under two minutes. There's a huge variety of options, models with memory foam layers to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side, models with a more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions, plus enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night. Unlike a lot of mattress companies out there, Helix owns its own manufacturing facility. Each and every Helix mattress is made by a team of skilled manufacturers and shipped directly from their facility to your door free of charge. They offer a 100-night trial and a 10 to 15-year warranty so you can try out your new Helix mattress without risk. When I took the quiz, I was matched with a Midnight Lux model and both my fellows love it and, of course, they love what we do on it. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders and a free bedroom bundle for our listeners in honor of Cyber Monday. The bundle includes two free pillows, as well as a set of sheets and even a mattress protector. Go to helixsleep.com slash savage and use the code helixpartner25. This is their best offer yet. It won't last long. Go get your new Helix mattress with your free bedroom bundle right now at helixsleep.com. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Hi, Dan. I'm a lesbian in my late 30s living in Europe, but my question pertains to a trip I'm taking back to the States for the holidays soon. Um, I came out as a lesbian quite young. Uh, school was pretty bad for me. Uh, three girls in particular made it that way. Constant taunts and horrible pranks, such as uh, dousing all my belongings in water or throwing them out the window before class, like every day. Uh, I haven't seen any of these girls since I was 17. So it was a really big surprise when one of them reached out to me on Instagram recently. I own a fashion brand and I sometimes model for it. And, and one of these girls was sending me a lot of likes and comments saying that I look good. And it was, it was weird. And then she started DMing me like flirty messages and I responded to them because I'm an idiot. I don't know. Um, and she didn't mention any of our past together and judging from her page she's now married to a guy with a couple of kids so I, I don't really know what her deal is there um she has asked me for a drink when i'm back in town for the holidays and i'm like kind of tempted but also i'm like am i gonna have sex with my bully like this girl honestly made my life hell for like four years and made me cry and, and wish I could just disappear. And I eventually did and cleared the country. So I'm, I'm really confused why I feel kind of sexually frustrated towards her now and why she wants to meet me for a drink, or maybe I'm getting it confused. It sounds pretty, pretty sexual, but if you have any advice about this, am I crazy to do this? I feel like I am crazy. I haven't thought about school in like 15 years. So this is really bringing back a lot of memories for me. I think I speak for everyone who just listened to your call when I say you should go fuck the shit out of this woman. What's going on here? Oh, she's married to a guy. She has a couple of kids. What's up with her? What's up is she's bisexual and she's into you, at least bisexual. Who knows? Maybe she's closeted. Maybe she's one of those people who brutally bullied an openly gay or perceived to be gay or lesbian or queer classmate because she was gay or lesbian herself. And she had externalized that internal conflict and was punishing you for being openly who she couldn't allow herself to be. And she was trying to control her own desires or extinguish them or draw people's attention away from her same-sex attractions by just being brutal to you about yours and fuck her and fuck bullies. And it's not always the case that bullies are externalizing an internal conflict, but it is so often the case that it's kind of a cliche. And now what do you do? Well, this person no longer holds any power over you. And in some way, 
from the perspective of adulthood, the people who drove you out of your hometown where this person is still stuck with her husband and her kids, did you a kind of favor? Yeah, you were cast out, but look at your hometown. Look at the people who are still there. Look at what you were cast out of. Sometimes the people without any intent, they're not trying to do us a favor. The people who drive us away set us on a course, give us a kind of momentum that leads to the life you have now. You are living in Europe. You own your own fashion brand. You are all over Instagram and the people you left behind, the people who thought they were expelling you, hurling you out of their orbit, now realize that they gave you, not that they gave you, it wasn't a gift that they gave you, but that you found inside yourself the strength to take the shitty energy they were hurling at you and let it power you. The positive spin on it. You got the fuck out of there, but look where you got to. Look where you landed. And so what do you do? Well, I don't know. She wants to have a drink with you. She's clearly into you. There's something about who you are now. There was probably something about who you were then that attracts her. Then from her, it attracted a lot of negative attention, this horrifying bullying that you endured, and I'm not trying to minimize that. Now it is attracting pure white hot desire, pure white hot envy in your shoes. Yeah, I would want to bask in that a little bit. Don't know if I would fuck my bully, but man, I would want to see the look on my bully's face when they realize that I have realized that they have realized that they want to fuck me and I am either not going to fuck them or I'm going to hate fuck the shit out of them. And while I hate fuck the shit out of them, make them apologize to me over and over and over again. This show is sponsored by Squarespace. If you're setting up a business or getting a creative or political project off the ground, you will find an indispensable partner in Squarespace. They make it easy to put together a good-looking website, blog, or online store. They have everything you need. Domains, marketing tools, analytics, e-commerce, 24-7 support. Squarespace empowers millions of creative types and entrepreneurs by providing them with the tools they need to bring their smart ideas to life. You can put together video ads, launch online courses, put out a virtual tip jar, or set up a scheduling calendar. All the tools you need to monetize your website and reach your goals are there waiting for you, well-designed and easy to set up. You'll create powerful email content that matches your website with your existing products, blog posts, and logos so your messaging is consistent and effective. And what's more, everything you make with Squarespace translates perfectly to mobile. Yeah! Head on over to squarespace.com slash savage for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code SAVAGE to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash savage and use the offer code SAVAGE. Hi, Dan. I'm married and I went to a party without my husband. My best friend and I ended up talking all night and she told me she loved me and saw us getting married someday and that I was the most important person to her above anyone. We did not kiss or anything. We hugged. We had our hands around one another's waist. I feel something so intense for her now, and I can't seem to shake it. It would completely fuck up my life to pursue it because we work in the same office. I'm married, and I'm also not sure if she feels the same because substances were involved. I have a feeling she does, and she really wants me to get together with her again, you know, and party but I'm scared and I feel fucked up about it because I can't, I keep thinking about it and about her and please don't judge. I, I didn't expect this. I'm just wondering, is this a passing feeling that will go away? Is this something I should pursue? I mean, we only have one life. Is this a passing feeling that will go away or is it something you should pursue? I don't know. I couldn't possibly tell you. I couldn't predict. You couldn't predict. You say there were substances involved. You say your friend wants to get together again with you and party. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that a particular substance was involved and it wasn't alcohol. It wasn't Bud Light. It wasn't banana daiquiris. I'm going to guess since you said substances and partying that we're talking about 
Molly, we're talking about ecstasy, we're talking about MDMA. If that's what we're talking about, if you guys were rolling together and you couldn't keep your hands off each other, but you weren't kissing and she had her hands around your waist the entire time and she was saying that she loved you and you were the most important person in her life and you were feeling those same things, it could have been the drugs. It could also, you know, in vino veritas, in ecstasy, honesty, maybe sometimes. But ecstasy, if we are talking again about ecstasy, about MDMA, about Molly, you know, sometimes has a way of making the person that you're with at the moment that you're on it feel like the person you love most in the world because they're the person right there which is not to say that your friend, your best friend from work doesn't love you and love you intensely. It's just, yeah, sometimes a substance like that, if again, that is the substance we're talking about here, has a way of intensifying those intense feelings. How do you find out if that's how you really feel? And if this is the person, if you suddenly realize that this is the person that you ought to be with, well, in our culture, what you're supposed to do if you have doubts before you pursue anything with this woman, with your best friend, you need to do the right thing and go to your husband and tell him that you couldn't possibly love him anymore because you have a crush on somebody else and that's dispositive. And so you're going to have to leave him and divorce him before you begin to date or pursue anything with your best friend. That's how people tell me it's supposed to work whenever – I tiptoe into advising someone who's in a relationship or married to somebody else to, you know, ride that crush out for a little bit, maybe test it, maybe hang out a few more times with that person before you do anything drastic, like get a fucking divorce or blow your marriage up or do irrevocable harm to your marriage by telling your husband that you have intense, perhaps even drug-fueled or drug-confused feelings for your best friend, romantic feelings for your best friend. But eventually you got to make a move. I, I, and I don't mean make a move like make a pass, particularly if this is somebody that you work with. Oh my God, what sort of shitstorm might that kick off if, you know, you fuck where you eat, as they say, and it goes badly. But you had one intense night with this person that was goosed by substances and by partying. Maybe have tea with this person. Maybe go out for coffee, stone cold sober, and say, what was that? Because I kind of felt it. And I don't think for me it was just the drugs. And then see what your friend says. And even then, even after seeing what your friend says, you're not going to know exactly what it is that you ought to do. Do you want out of your marriage. You don't say anything about your marriage, whether it's a good marriage, a bad marriage, whether you still love your husband, don't love your husband, whether getting out of this marriage would be an impossibility, whether you have kids or not, you give us no information and no callback number. Please give your callback number. Sometimes I want more information about the quality of your marriage. I think it would be great if our marriages allowed us a little space. If our marriages were a little less brittle and every once in a while we were allowed, even if the marriage wasn't open, just to have feelings for someone else, a crush on someone else, to maybe have a passionate romantic friendship with someone else without that having the label emotional cheating slapped on it or micro infidelity or macro infidelity slapped on it and everybody then being convinced that the marriage has to end because of this violation that involved no sexual contact, but an emotional connection. Maybe we just need a kind of polyamory for monogamists that allows for sometimes having feelings for somebody else without then having to jump to the conclusion that the having of feelings for someone else means that the marriage is hollow or meaningless or a sham or must end that the right thing to do then is to exit the marriage because passions come and go. You could pursue this. There could be something real there 
and it could run its course in three months. And then if you're still married, you may find yourself falling back in love with your husband or that relationship entering a new phase and, and, and taking off again. But if this runs its course in three months and you've left your husband, then what? Then where are you? I guess you're free to date other people. You're free to pick up the pieces, but you're not free to pick things back up with the husband you left because you did the right thing and ended your marriage before you explored or pursued what might be possible with your friend. All right, before we get to this week's listener response calls, I want to share a couple of comments about last week's show posted at savage.love. Says Andrew, thank you, Dan, for thinking of those of us who are alone on Thanksgiving. I always used to have Misfits Thanksgiving, a gathering on Thursday for people who don't have a place to be. Now it seems the idea is Friendsgiving, held a few days before actual Thanksgiving, so the normies can have a Thanksgiving dinner with friends, but then go spend Thursday with their normie families. Normies have co-opted our misfit culture, then leave us misfits alone on Thanksgiving. I wasn't aware that the normies had co-opted Friendsgiving and were kind of double dipping, getting Friendsgiving and Thanksgiving, but it seems to me misfits can still get together on the Thursday of Thanksgiving, and if you can't call it Friendsgiving anymore or don't want to, how about calling it misgivings. Says Blithering, for the gay guy whose mother said she knows more about being gay than he does, my response would have been to ask about her reasoning. My 96-year-old mom's first relationship in the 1940s turned out to be as the unwitting beard of a gay man. That experience helped her understand when I came out. If the caller asked sincerely, he might learn some of his mom's secret history. I love the expression mom's secret history. Every mom has one. I feel like moms should write those secret histories down for their grandkids to read one day. Finally, says Orchid Thief, for the guy who wants kids dating a woman who doesn't, the issue is not hers. The issue is yours. You need to figure out if you want kids. If you want kids, break up. End of story. This is a base level compatibility issue. If you don't want kids, stay together. And if you aren't sure, don't have kids. Only bring kids into the world if you know you want them. All right, for more listener comments and more of my responses to those comments, check out Struggle Session, a weekly bonus column exclusively for Magnum subscribers. It goes up every Thursday at savage.love. For all the perks, become one of my subs today for as little as eight bucks right now at savage.love slash subscribe. And now, Listener response calls. Hi, Dan. I'm calling about to respond to the caller, the woman who has the cutesy language with her lover, and she really loves her own um, coos and ahs and ahs and really gets his get on her nerves. Uh, I'm kind of a language and ling linguistics nerd, and there's a term called phatic speech that I learned that is basically language that just says, I'm communicating with you. It's like when you're sitting next to somebody you love and you say, silence for a while, doing your own thing, and then you say, Hey, so when I was in my 20s, I was in a relationship with a woman, and I was emotionally closed off. We, um, over the course of those years, started doing much more of that cutesy language. You know, we had our own words of, of could have been a dictionary. And I think we replaced our meaningful conversations with cute language. I'm not saying that cute language, phatic speech, is Always a bad thing. Most of the time, it's great. We got to say to each other, I'm here. I'm present. I see you. I'm happy to be with you. But when you begin to feel something like that coward did, there's a kind of imbalance. Like, I don't like his cute language. Something is going unsaid. This is a response call for last week's episode with the caller who was shocked that his wife was asking for a divorce, seemingly without any warning whatsoever. Dan's response was very generous, but I believe that there could be a different explanation. It's almost a stereotype now that men are completely shocked when their wives ask for a divorce, as if their wives' unhappiness sprung out of nowhere. It's important for the men in these situations to ask themselves, are you really that surprised? If you actually think about it for just a minute, can you truly think of no reason whatsoever that your wife would want to get a divorce? Most men will respond by admitting that yes, he knew that his wife was unhappy, but he thought it was what the internet has started calling a, quote, tolerable level of permanent unhappiness. They think that because she's not in absolute misery, she's happy enough to stay forever. 
It's my theory that the caller's wife has voiced her unhappiness probably many times and was either dismissed or her needs were only met temporarily, only for the relationship to go back to the way it was. She just finally realized that a baseline of unhappiness wasn't the future that she wanted for herself. And I say, good for her. Hello, Dan Savage. Uh, so basically, I just wanted to comment on the phobia that you mentioned in last week's episode. You were talking about phobia quite a bit. And in my kind of recent work that I've been doing, there's kind of this transition over to the word misic, misia. So homo misia, bi misia, trans misia. It takes away the idea that these people have an irrational fear and puts more emphasis on the fact that there is a dedicated hatred towards that thing, uh, which is, I believe, more appropriate to what we're all experiencing. And so let's use the appropriate terms. I hope you come on board with us. So homo misic, trans misic, bi misic, homophobia, transphobia, and biophobia, all the misias, no longer phobias, we're not letting them get away with the fact that they're just scared and ignorant. They actively hate us. And we're going to leave it there. Got a question for next week's Lovecast or something to say about something I said on this week's Lovecast? You can record your question or your comment at savage.love slash askdan right now. And yes, do it now while that question or comment is fresh in your mind. You can also use the voice memo app on your phone and email your question to q at savage.love or you can pretend it's the 1990s and call our actual landline and leave us a message at 206-302-2064. December 8th is almost here. December 8th is the deadline for submissions for Hump 2024. It is not too late to make that brilliant short porn movie for America's most brilliant short porn film festival. Go to humpfilmfest.com slash submit for all the info you need about getting your dirty little porn masterpiece into my dirty little porn film festival. Follow me on Instagram and threads at Dan Savage. Follow me at Blue Sky at Dan Savage. And I'm still on the bad place at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Dr. Debbie Herbenick on Twitter at Debbie Herbenick. And check out her website, DebbieHerbenick.com, where you can order copies of her new book, Yes, Your Kid Makes a Great Gift for Parents of Teenagers and for Kids Who Will One Day Be Teenagers. Yes, Your Kid is out now. The Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and Nancy and the Tech Savvy at Risk Youth. We will all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thank you for downloading. Please give your seat to someone who may need it.